Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to today's webinar, uh, looking at digital do's and don'ts. Really nice for you to have joined us this afternoon. I'm Linda Coburn, I'm the moderator of the webinar. So I'm just going to do a little bit of preamble, explain to you how we work and what's going to happen this afternoon. So the webinar is brought to you by The Space. Um, if you're not aware of us as an organisation, in essence, we're the UK's digital commissioning and development agencies for the arts and culture sector. And as you can see, we've worked with um, a really, really extensive wide range of organisations over the last few years um, in terms of supporting commissions and a wider programme of skills development. And so the digital do's and don'ts that we're bringing to you today are really the culmination of what we've learned for, for what the panelists have learned for working with that really wide range of organizations so hopefully we're really really helpful to all of you and nice to see that people are saying hello and thank yous as we go along okay so um here's the plan for the session we've um decided that what we're going to do is split this really into thinking about the sort of stages of a digital um production or project we're talking about pre-production, the planning and the thinking about something in advance, the actual making of it, the production, and then the, the post-production, i.e. how you sort of finally craft your work and then how you get it out there to an audience. Um, and all of our panellists will be kind of chipping in and uh, I'll introduce them in a minute, Natalie, Rob and Sarah, they'll all be chipping in and talking about their sort of experience and examples in each of those stages of a, a digital uh, project life cycle as it were um, and then lots of opportunity for questions from the audience all the way through so the other things to bear in mind are that um, we are recording the session so it'll be available on our youtube channel afterwards um, and you can come back to it then or, or share with friends um, and if you would like to use the captions uh, if closed captioning is helpful to you jen our lovely captioner has put the instructions into the top of the webinar chat so that you can um, so that you can uh, work out how to do that. And the third thing to say really is that we use chat a lot for um, adding links, discussion between all the panelists and the webinar attendees. And also if you've got specific questions for our panelists, put them into chat and then I'll put the questions forward to the panelists. Um, so that is the, uh, the the plan for how we work and just really, you know, as many questions as you have, uh, contributions much welcome. Sometimes the discussion between people in the audience is, you know, gives us all loads more information and um, insight than we would have got otherwise. So we appreciate all of that. OK, so uh, without further ado, I am going to ask our panellists to reveal themselves. That's Sarah, Natalie and Rob. I'll get them to introduce themselves so you've got a sense of who they are, the kind of work they do, and what they bring to this, and then we'll go into thinking about the different steps of the, of the process. So I'm going to start with um, Sarah. Hello. Oh. Will, will you say something about your job, the kind of work you do and the projects that you work on? Yeah, um, so I'm a distributor and a digital producer. So I work across a number of uh, the space commissions. So from some of the low cost captures to the multidisciplinary uh, projects that we have. And at the moment, I've got um, quite a big focus on branching narrative works. Mm. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, Natalie, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Natalie. I'm a commissioning editor at Space. I work mainly on our broadcast and video work because my background is in TV and before joining the space I was a TV producer on the BBC Proms and various arts and history um, documentaries. Recent projects that I've worked on at the space include a live capture of Tartuffe from Birmingham Rep that's going out on the BBC in March, a short film about natural dyeing from the Growing Colour Together project in Kirklees. And I've just spotted there's someone from Kirklees in the chat, so hello. And three short dance education films um, from Dance East, looking at different natural habitats and the threat that climate change poses to them. And that's, that's a package of three films for primary aged children. So just can I pick up on that? So you're saying, you know, your background is in TV. How is that relevant to the sort of wider digital world? 
Well, I think from my experience, there's a lot of the same issues apply, whether it's um, vid digital video or, you know, large scale TV documentaries. Um, same editorial and production questions, challenges, ambitions come up time and time again. It's just on a slightly different scale. So a lot of what you could, what works for if you have perfected a 10 minute video, the step to an hour long video is not that far away. So a lot of the same things come up. Thank you. And actually, and this is reminding me, I want to go back to Sarah. So you've introduced yourself as a distributor and a producer, and we know that you're moving more into production. And um, could you want to say a little bit about that? Sort of yeah. how the one works with the other? Yeah, um, they're completely um, entwined. I think, yeah, we'll, we'll come on to talk about it, but um, I think one of the biggest uh, issues, things for people to think about at the very early stages in their production is the distribution. And it's not a thing that gets tacked on at the end. And so, um, was working with more and more organizations right up at the beginning uh, of their works about the distribution question. And it's because it's so embedded, it just made sense uh, for me to sort of focus on the other uh, areas as well, just because they are so fundamentally connected. Yeah. So we think of people tend to think of them as separate things, but what you're saying, your role is kind of seeing that there's a real blurring and an importance of bringing those two things together. Thank you. Um, Rob, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Linda. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Rob Lindsay. I was previously digital lead at Birmingham Royal Ballet for a long, long time, and then part of the BBC Digital Grillers before joining BBC Three in the year that became a digital only channel. Um, since then, I've worked in the space for a number of years across lots and lots of different projects, and I'm currently head of programmes overseeing the commissioning programme and the mentoring programme as well. Um, through both of these programmes of support, we help lots and lots of teams and individuals who are exploring their own challenges and their own aims around digital. Um, particularly on the mentoring programme, we do find that some of the most common questions are, are it's often phrased, how can we do better? And uh, we'll hopefully be able to explore lots of that today. Yeah. So, so I guess what you're, you're bringing to this is thinking about the, the questions that come up for you again and again from different kinds of organisations across the mentoring programme. It's exactly that, it's exactly that. Often it's people who have started doing things, have put a toe in the water, you know, have been doing experiments, particularly over the last couple of years as well. And it's people that maybe feel that they're not quite getting the results that they wanted, or they're, they're maybe, they're just not quite, their work's not quite connecting with audiences as well. So we'll, we'll talk through some of the obstacles that sometimes people encounter and maybe some of the places where they stumble along the way. Thank you. And I, I've noticed that um, David has put into the chat, David here from Sirius, looking to refine some of the things we learned on the fly in lockdown. Exactly. So, brilliant. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for introducing yourselves. Now we're, we're going to start by, as I said, you know, thinking about that pre-production, the early stages of digital projects. And when we were developing the webinar, it was one of those things that all three of you were really echoing. This is the most important stage in a project. So really, really important part of the process. And so I'm going to come to Sarah first and ask you, when you're starting to work with or on a new project, what, what kinds of things are you looking for? What, where does the conversation start for you, Sarah? Yeah, so um, I should say, so with this, it's, it's for space projects, but I think it's relevant across any, uh, any project, any digital project that anyone is starting. Um, but with the space commissions, it is usually the idea that gets through. Um, so we've seen something and we think, oh, okay, that could really have an audience, um, even if all of the parts of the jigsaw are not necessarily in place. Um, so part of our work um, is to sort of muddle through where the gaps are and what's possible. So someone might um, come to us and say that they really want to focus on a new interactive project, but it's not specified exactly where that interactivity is, is coming from. Um, so it's on us to interrogate that, um, including, you know, asking questions like, OK, so you've looked at this technology. Have you done the research into alternatives? And if they have, exploring that with them. And if they haven't, 
helping them on that journey um, through the sort of expertise gained on other projects um, and just having an understanding of what's going on in their industry. Um, and I think this initial bit of work uh, is the most important bit of the whole process. Um, so it's it's fairly time consuming uh, and we sort of um, a mix, me, Rob, Natalie and some other colleagues, we will sit with the commissioned organization and really go through every part of their plan um, and just see what we might unpack. Um, so I think, some of the questions that we might include at the beginning um, process, that opening conversation, um, could be where the distribution or marketing comes in, hence the shift uh, in what I'm focusing on. So those would include um, who you think your audience is, but also who you want them to be. So it might be a fairly new organization or a new area of focus for that organization. So it's a kind of like wish list of what they want. Um, that, that is, I think, the most important thing to interrogate upfront. So obviously we're talking from the perspective of a funder or a commissioner. So we have to ensure that every single project um, has the potential to reach uh, a, a really good audience. But again, I think it's true of any project. Um, but then what happens, what tends to happen is as production goes on um, and the creative team get busier and busier, I think that question of who it's for and how you're going to reach them tends to um, take a bit of a backseat. So it's our job, and I think we're all on the same page with this, is to just keep bringing that question um, to the forefront and dig it back out at every opportunity. Um, and the reason that we do that is because it, it influences every single decision um, that is made through the creative process. Um, so it's like down to what tech they're using, which platform the project is being published to, how long the experience is, what tone the experience is going to take, what supporting assets are needed, how much time overall to allocate to the project. Um, and then obviously it has uh, budgetary implications as well. Um, so to give a slightly more specific example, if it's a short film, that they've come to us with or a low cost capture project uh, and the organization or the artist wants an online release and for it to go to festivals, which is a very common aim for like a 10 minute film. Um, that question about the distribution, it affects the production timeline. So when you need to submit it by, um, the budget for festival submissions, social spend for online work and the supporting assets, the format of the work itself so how long it should be to be optimized for each platform, where it's going to go if it's um, two minutes, five minutes, 30 minutes. It affects the people in your team, like the personnel, um, because if you need a trailer, is this within your editor's brief or are you going to do that separately? Are those skills that you have in house? Um, and then also the artistic focus of the work. Um, you know, is it for families? What's the tone uh, it's going to take? Like, ha do you have partners on board that are going to have an impact on that um, when it comes to asking them to share the work? Is it for an educational audience? Do you need um, additional resources, like one of the projects that Natalie's working on? Um, so that's just like a small film example. But these questions, obviously, they become even more relevant for any of the XR projects that we work on and also the longer form capture work. Um, so that's why in terms of like what is the do, it's just stressing that importance of where it's going to go and who it's for. Thank you. Anybody else got anything else they want to chip in at the moment? I would just say, just because that it can sound like it is a lot of work to think through all of that, 
but it also can be very helpful. Those, it's like creating your boundaries right at the beginning of, and as Sarah beautifully demonstrated there, it's a sequence of decisions. So why are we doing this to reach family audience? So who is it for kids aged five to 10? So what's the platform that those families will access it? We're gonna put it on the, you know, it, it, and actually those decisions become helpful because they rule things out as much as they're ruling things in. So although it might sound like a frightening list of questions, actually will kind of fuel things and make decision making as you go through the process very easy if you have the answers to those questions set out. And as Sarah described, like there's some platforms which a certain duration of thing will not work for. There's some platforms where Sarah's branching narratives, she's done several projects, won't support. So those things become, it takes on a momentum that means that those decisions, those decisions made at the beginning will save time later. Is there anything particular that you'd, you know, do's or don'ts in terms of choosing platforms and technologies, how, how you make those decisions? That's a question to anybody, really. Any thoughts on how people, what, anything, how you ought to go about that, a really good way of doing it? I would just say do as much research as possible and ask people whose projects you like. So normally if you're, you know, if you've come up with an idea for a project, you, you, you have seen something similar somewhere. And I would say don't be, you know, in the kind of artistic community, I think um, people are very, very generous with their time and sharing their knowledge, just asking people why they chose that platform they will have uh, loads of alternatives that they explored and they you know um chose not to do whatever and i think it's just that it, it's it's knowledge i think that's what um the space is so because we work on so many projects we know what platforms are effective um but if you are an artist you know going out independently i think it's just speaking to people and finding out what is out there and what are the requirements of the different, um, certainly for online publishers, so that you can make the, the best informed decision for your project. Yeah. Because if I go into, there's just so many um, different options, but I would say, you know, pick your genre, narrow it down a bit, and then just, there's no such thing as too much research. I think as well, it can be useful to really consider what do you want to happen next? So if you're going to put a piece out on a particular platform, is that a platform where you're going to build an ongoing relationship with people? You're going to build up an ongoing community. Um, is it a place where you're going to do one piece of work and it's going to serve its purpose and that's that's sort of going to be it? You know, are there requirements of audiences on there? Have a real think about what you're going to do if something's successful, just as much as you'd consider what we're going to do if this needs an extra push or extra work. It's it's those sort of questions as well. And again, exactly as Sarah says, there are different platforms that may have different requirements or different audience expectations or, or uh, yeah, or different kind of format restrictions or whatever it might happen to be. So yeah, have a think about those things and have a real think about what, what you want to happen next, because that can sometimes steer you too. Is there, are there any other, between the three of you, any other really good questions? Because, because we're talking about, you know, what how the space works with organizations and I'm thinking if you were an organization who didn't have that support what are the brilliant questions you should be asking yourselves and you have given lots of them already but is there any other really good questions that we haven't added in yet I'd, I'd say it's it's probably that what is the measure of success of this project you know it's exactly a lot of the work that we've done on lots and lots of projects has been okay we're gonna we're gonna do this you know we're going to create something we're going to embark on a project what is success because it is a big broad internet out there there's a there's a, a big audience potentially we're never going to be able to reach all of them there's always going to be more people that haven't seen our stuff and uh, I think sometimes we feel we've put something online and it hasn't got you know a million views or something like that and I think it's about being really really clear well we were never looking for that what's the what's the what's the measure of success that we're actually going for so that we can go away from a project feeling that was really successful rather than oh, I feel that could have been bigger because I think that way kind of lies madness a little bit so have a real think about what that metric is it might not be audience views as well you might be trying to 
monetize, you might be trying to reach a really specific demographic again, everything that's already been said. But I think be really, really clear in your head about what the measure of success is and, and why you're doing something. When you're saying that, it's making me think, it's often when, you, uh, when you're working with, somebody's immersed in a project, it's very hard for them to articulate those things. You know, you kind of want, an, you know, if you ask somebody who's the audience, they might say everybody, because that's what you'd like, isn't it? For the whole world to love your work. So I guess having somebody to bounce those questions backwards and forwards and be quite brutal with you and, yes. and probe is a really helpful thing, isn't it? And, and, and we've spoken to organisations and said, you know, what's your priority here? Is it to get as much attention as possible to as wide an audience? Is it to do something for the, for the, the, the kind of credibility you know do you want to do something with a particular partner is it to monetize and we've seen we've had lots and lots of people who have said well all of those really and often there's tension between those aims and i think you need to be really really mercenary and, and brutal and honest with yourself and say look which of these is the priority one of those has to take precedence because decisions will come along throughout the project that mean you're going to have to go more in one area than another rather than trying to be a one size fits all project that just doesn't happen Thank you. So there's a question here that um, I'll, I'll read it out to you and then just wave if you've got a good thought on it, which is sort of following on from that, really. What what are the one or two misconceptions that people have about what digital projects can offer? And what's realistic to get them to recognise the limitations slash opportunities? And I guess by people, Kat, you're talking about the, uh, the arts organisation, the people within the arts organisation. Yes. So what, what are the misconceptions and, and how, how do you recognise the limitations and opportunities? So maybe this is best demonstrated by like an example we see quite a lot, which is um, there's like the core project um, for, you know, it, it's um, a low cost project. Maybe it's a short film. Um, maybe it's one of these branching narrative projects. And then something that comes along is like, Oh, and then to promote it, we'll make a podcast um, and just not and like really underestimate the fact that that is in itself the exact same amount of work as your core project. Um, and so I think there's underestimate underestimating the amount of work, fun, creative work, but work that goes into each each element of this. Um, so, yeah, I think. Un underestimating how much work is involved in in these um, projects is one and then the other one is that they're either going to make loads of money or they're going to just people will just watch them like people will watch them but they don't without any sort of like really structured plan of how you're going to get an audience which is what and I will bang on about this a lot but it's just that um, importance of getting, it's quite a met methodological, I can't say that word, approach baked in at the beginning. You know, there, there's like a real strategy to it um, and you will get there and it's totally possible to get thousands of people to engage with your work, but it doesn't happen by accident. It never happens by accident. That's just not a thing. It's, um, you know, there are like formulas that you can put in place and it's really important to follow them. So don't underestimate how much work that is. As Natalie alluded to, I don't want to sound scary. I think it's really fun work. It's just really important to be, um, to have a good process when you put that in place. Yeah. So things just won't happen on their own. And um, things like, Oh, and then we'll set up a TikTok, or we'll we'll make a um, we'll make a podcast. Is like that is a project in itself. It's a brilliant project, but like you know, um, maybe just looking over and saying, oh, well, they achieved it without really digging into how they achieved it um, is something that happens quite a lot. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Natalie. Did you have something to add? I, well, I would just broaden out Sarah's it doesn't happen by accident to include the creative because that's the other thing we see for the, from the produ a production point of view is people think, you know, especially if it's based on existing work, whether that's, uh, you know, an exhibition or an existing performance, 
you know, oh, we'll stick a camera on it and then it will look that will immediately translate for um, the, a digital audience. And the truth is we've got we are incredibly um, refined viewers and we could be watching something that costs 20 million pounds on Netflix. But again, that's not to be scary, but you there's got to be some thought into how you're going to translate that experience for a viewer at home and a sort of a wide shot of a stage for 90 minutes, apart from a very small cluster of fans of somebody in the show, people are not going to last through 90 minutes of a single wide shot. So there's an art in it, even if it's something that is, it exists already, there is an art form in the middle of that process of giving it to a digital audience. And that's not to be underestimated. When we're talking about performance capture, so capturing a performance, whether it's classical music, pop music, a theatre or a dance production, I always say it's like the director's cut is the digital version because the director at that point is able to say, I really want you to look at this in close up or I really want you to take in the whole stage right now or can you focus on the trumpeter because this is the solo moment. And that's obviously control that you don't have in a in a live venue. Your audience is looking around, looking at their next door neighbor, looking at the phone that shouldn't be ringing in their handbag, whatever. Um, but there is in creating that director's cut. There's also there's also a lot of work, and it also things that are beautifully shot don't happen or recorded. The same goes for creating a an audio experience, they don't happen by accident either, even if the work already exists and is brilliant. So we're saying lots of planning, lots of thinking, lots of big strategic questions at the beginning. What Would any of you have a kind of an idea, if you were thinking about um, the, the length of making a digital project, what proportion of it is, goes into the pre-production? How much of your time do you load up the front before you go into production? It's probably the longest phase on some projects that we've done. I mean, it, it sort of depends on the nature of the 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 the, the um, production phase. You know, if you're doing a I don't know a time lapse documentary over twelve months or something like that, it's obviously going to be longer. But it's a it's a significant chunk of change, and I think people do think, you know, great, let's get going. And actually, there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, up front just in order to make that production phase and particularly that post production phase easier because if that time isn't done up front your production and particularly your post-production phase can become a bit of a nightmare um, with lots and we suddenly realize how many things haven't been addressed in a bit of a kind of oh, we'll cover that later we'll fix it in the edit we'll cross that bridge when we come to it um that that can be tricky can be tricky and i'd say maybe not like time what like percentage of time but definitely in terms of like creative thinking and headspace and like really thinking through everything I, I would agree with Rob that it's it's the majority because it's like if you get that bit sorted everything else just will fall into place so much easier and if you don't get that bit right you will spend double the time on every other bit trying to sort of clean up what wasn't thought through at the beginning um which can also be very expensive so maybe not you know actual time or it's six months planning but in terms of like really the like painful thinking through the nuts and bolts and like you know possible pitfalls and solutions the bulk of it is at the beginning yeah it is i mean i will say it's uh, it, at the same time, it's an opportunity to, for example, get vast swathes of your organisation on site. You know, if you're working as a team or an individual with other uh, with other kind of partners or collaborators, you know, this is really is the point where you you can really um, give everyone ownership over this project. You can really get people on board with what it is that you're trying to achieve and, and why you're doing it. You know, why you're doing all those things and get people excited about it. Really get everyone on the same page. I mean, I think there's a phenomenal amount of internal ownership and excitement can be generated at that period as well so you know it, it it's not just it's not just the kind of admin chawsy bit you know i think people sometimes feel that it's yeah it's it's yeah it's the boring bit at the beginning it's all the kind of prep and admin and you know there is part of that but there is an opportunity for 
people to get really excited about the project too. Um, I just wonder, so you've talked a, a lot about some of the, your recommendations and I'm just wondering whether you've got any kind of links to tools or groups or if there's anywhere you go for inspiration or advice or kind of keeping track on trends, anything you could add into, into the chat to share with people and so it would be if the audience, any of you have any recommendations of what, you know, where do you go to kind of stay across and work out what's going on, that would be great. Thank you. Oh yes, Sarah's, Sarah's put in her uh, uh, really good distribution article. Fantastic. Yeah. Can I say very quickly as well, Sarah, I know we, we've got a lot to get through, but yeah, Kat's just put a comment in the chat as well, which is absolutely true. Is one misconception that digital is easy because everyone's doing it and it can be done quickly. So against the pre-production success model. I mean, this is a really key thing is the only digital material you see are the ones that have been done well you know i'll talk about this a little bit more later on but there are lots and lots of digital projects that you you specifically don't see because that work's not been put in or because things just haven't had the infrastructure underneath them the, the support underneath them in order to reach an audience as well so yeah i think i think there is part of that we kind of see the things that do well and assume that they're there for the majority and they're not um Another question which hasn't come up yet, but it was in my mind, was the idea, was the thinking about accessibility and inclusion. And I guess that's another thing that you just, it needs to happen, uh, like everything, isn't it? It's early on, sort of starting to think about who, who, how are you going to reach people, what you're going to provide them with and that. Yeah, yeah. And committing to that as well, you know, because you may find that as you go into your project, timelines get stretched or, or particular areas take up more time than you need. And, and I think... There are things like that accessibility is incredibly important to commit to up front and, and be really really clear that the final product that you're creating the final project the final offering um is absolutely going to be as accessible as possible yeah okay um just last shout for any questions before we sort of move from the the pre thinking about pre-production into thinking about uh, the production processes themselves so just give it a minute see if there's any last questions there um just a last one on my list was in terms of kind of skills and advisors and people you work with is there anybody who you really would need to get involved is there I mean, i'm just thinking about who are the people you might get involved oh there's a there's a oh right so there's somebody asking about mentoring or being a sounding board so i'll just <laughs> i'll get rob to answer that and then just think if is it i'll come back again to the last question we we absolutely do have a mentoring program and there'll be another one later in the year i i would say um i think my email address is on the website so uh yeah to is that um to the person from dance north yeah drop me a line we'll chat about it. so so yes i was just asking about you know in terms of planning is it better to have everybody who might be have an interest involved or do you have to do a lot of this work on your own or in a small group and then involve people how what i so I would definitely say get um, get as many people involved in those early conversations as possible because of the things we've just spoken about. Like, um, you know, as long as they're on board and invested in in the project. Um, and I know it's a really tricky thing to do because when you you're in that early, it's like quite a fragile state you know you've come up with this idea it's your creative idea it's easy to be very protective over it um until it's sort of grown to a degree and there's like a confidence to speaking to people about it but the more voices you can add in early on i think you know the more knowledge you have to inform um what it is you're going to make and all of those things that we just spoke about about where it's going to go and what format it's going to take like um in a live theater environment you get the marketing team in early on or you run the risk of programming clashes and all sorts of you know you could decide you're doing hamlet and that's a really great idea and you've got things but it could be that two of the surrounding theatres have done that production in the last six months. It didn't sell very well, the you know, and so it's it's really important to have that information, I guess, before it gathers so much momentum that you end up slightly down a cul-de-sac and being a bit trapped with this idea because it wasn't opened up early enough. Um, and I know I'm just I know that it's really tricky to do that, especially with creative projects and being in the arts. Um, 
but I I would say as many as many people as you can bear. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Um. Thank you. Thank you. And and Kat saying, where do we find people to help us? Does anybody have any good resources or reading? So I guess I throw that out there to to all. Any recommendations? Much re happily received. And um and we're going to sh oh go on Rob and then we'll move. I was going to say uh, what you'll also find as well is some of the um some big lessons from digital projects are probably the things that people aren't going to write down they're not going to publish so if you're going to embark on a project and you've seen someone who's done something similar uh, drop them a line you know see if you can just sort of have a chat with them as well people will be very very willing to share more stories that they maybe wouldn't be prepared to write down um it can be a really really nice way so yeah try that people are always really happy to to kind of share their experiences and often as i say will be much more candid on a phone call than they would do written down Thank you very much. Okay, so production, we're sort of moving along to that next. And we, um, the question really to start with goes to Natalie, which is saying, you know, as a producer, what, what is going through your mind as a production moves or as a project moves into that production phase? So if you're coming from pre-production to production, you're essentially moving from, from the sort of thinking phase of a project to the doing phase of the project which can be really energizing for you if the, you're the producer or the project manager and the whole team as Rob alluded to a few moments ago getting kind of buy-in from lots of collaborators sort of within your organization can be really important because you know you, especially if you're doing a digital project for the first time it's amazing who you might need to call on within your organization so buy-in from collaborators is really important. Um, so I think there are four things that I would have at the front of my mind moving into production. So I'm just going to run through them quickly. The first thing I do um, before make, doing any making or filming or recording is a rights health check. Um, that may well have been part of your pre-production if your rights have been particularly complicated and my rights clearance costs may well have affected your budget. Um, but this is the point you really need to take a really fine tooth comb to your rights position. The question you should be asking yourself is who and what is in your digital piece of work that you're producing and who has created it? Performers, a writer, a designer, choreographer, composer. Do you have music from iTunes in there? Do you have images that you've taken from Google Images? Do you have photos or logos that are part of the set? or the costume, or in your props. You need to clear the rights to use all of that. And that means at a very basic level, you need to obtain legal permission to use that piece of artistic IP in the piece of work that you're creating. Each thing needs a paper trail and almost always needs a payment. Rights could and indeed do take up a whole presentation of themselves and the space has a rights presentation later in March and previous pre um, webinars that we've done on the topic of rights are available to view on our YouTube channel, but I felt it was important to put the red flag in the sand today, just to make sure you know what's in your piece of work, whose work you need to license and give yourself the time and budget to do so rights issues are the most common reason at the space that we see projects fall over or run into difficulty um, and to give a quick illustration of that um, last year we were going to work on a pantomime filmed for family audiences um, and it wasn't until quite far in that the theatre team said that the it was a, actually a jukebox pantomime and 10 there were 10 commercial tracks in the show, including the Bee Gees and Beyonce. Um, a PRS license for a live venue does not cover your use of commercial music um, as soon as you record it, as soon as you distribute it digitally, whether that's an audio or video recording. So I approached um, a music supervisor we often work with just to get a, a guesstimate of what what clearing those tracks would involve. And he estimated it would cost him five days of his time plus 20,000 pounds worth of clearance costs. So I don't think it'll surprise you to hear that sadly the pantomime didn't go ahead, but that's where rights can really, can really scupper a project. So that's point one, think about your rights position. Number two, um, 
you need to weigh up your ambition versus your capacity and um, that slightly hit, tilts to what was asked before in the chat and um, can you do what you want to with the time money and people that you have available or should you adjust your plan i'm going to give you two examples about how that might play out often people approach the space to talk about a live stream but when we talk through the realities of being truly live and uh, which means you can't have any dead time on air so intervals pre-show all of that time has to be filled by content even if it's just a card your technical infrastructure needs to be absolutely rock solid and um, you need to have a plan in place in case the stream falls over in terms of comms and messaging. All of that requires meticulous planning and lots of people decide to cut their cloth a bit differently and pre-record um, what they were going to their performance footage and then put it out as live later. There are some instances where being live, truly live, is worth it, has benefits, or is even necessary. But it just gives you an idea that going in with a live stream, you can, you can refine your thoughts if it doesn't work for what your capacity is. On a slightly different tack, we know that a lot of arts organizations are being asked to um, create YouTube channels, at, uh, sorry, to create TikTok accounts. And um, TikTok has lots of upsides, it's DIY approach, it's open to lots of possibilities for community building, but it absolutely eats content. Um, so if you don't have the capacity, the manpower to service a TikTok account, it's probably not going to be the platform for you. And that's absolutely fine. As Rob often says, give yourself permission to say no to certain platforms. Linda, I knew this was going to happen. My doorbell has just rung for something that was going to be delivered earlier. So I'm going to just pause and I'll come back for steps two. And <laughs> okay well well let's just carry on so so just ask the other two of you natalie's talking about rights being something which can really sort of stall a project is there anything else that you would sort of raise as a flag to sort of possible real thing things that could really trip you up uh, well i mean i i think it, it's it, rights is is quite a good example of this there quite often are elements of a theatre show or a live show or an exhibition or whatever it might be that you can't translate into a digital uh into a digital medium um it that might be uh music it might be imagery it might be anything at all it's really 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 important that when you're in that production phase if you have an element where you think there might be an issue here try and record an alternative try and give yourself something else don't just say i will fix that in the edit you know have a real think about what can we give to the editor? What can we, what options, what alternatives can we do? Because that might need to be something that you shoot on the day or you record or you capture or, or whatever. It might be that rather than just doing a theatre show as a kind of run through, you do have to say, right, we're going to stop and just do an alternative version of this with a different background or without the music or with something else. That's that's the one thing that I, I'd really say on that. Um Rob, I just I made a note to myself was that the conversation we had before, and you you said some you quoted somebody else saying that being a producer is finding the bits you're worried about and addressing those, which yeah. I thought was a really good a good way of looking at it, isn't it? If you're if you're a bit daunted about something, it's worth poking into. Exactly, exactly, and it doesn't all have to fall on your shoulders. That might be a you know a collaborative um, process with the people around you, but yeah, don't don't leave things that you're worried about. Make sure you you try and address those as soon as you possibly can. But yeah. Anything, Sarah, is there anything else that you would add to that? No, probably not. No. Okay. All right then. Um, I mean, I'm back. Would you like me to do points three and four? Oh, sorry, yeah. I'm, after my intermission, would you like me to do points three and four? <laughs> but, but, um, Rob has just picked up on the idea of giving yourselves alternatives and thinking about what if this doesn't work. So just to say that, that he's he's talked a bit about that, you've got the idea of sort of getting to your idea of plan B's. Amazing. So yes, once you've sort of worked out what you can do and be honest with yourself about what that is, you can then move forward. My third point is about editorial or creative planning. Um, write a script or a storyboard or a content plan or do a paper edit. It's amazing how often people have a sort of amorphous idea of the creative and then things jump very quickly into logistical planning, scheduling, budgeting, and you don't go back to do the same kind of meticulous planning over your creative idea. 
but it's crucial to the success of your project that you've really bottomed out how it's going to work creatively. Um, even for an existing staged piece, you need to plan what you want your cameras to do or your recorder to capture. So think about what the heart of your creative project is and what you're trying to make your audience feel or know or understand as part of it and try and draw that out in a kind of solid plan of some description that you can share with the people that you're working with. And then finally, and this goes in part to what Rob's already mentioned, um, plan B, as a project manager or a producer, you really need to be 10 steps ahead. So my advice is have the B, C and Z plans and think through creative alternatives. If you don't get the rights clearance to that track that you love, do you have another two lined up that you know are clearable, possibly library tracks that are relatively inexpensive? And um, if you're filming outside and the weather's going to be bad what are you going to do and um, allow some wiggle room in your both your budget and your schedule for things going not to plan so that's where contingency line is really important and just to go to what Rob, exactly what Rob said there's leave your give yourself some latitude creatively to if it's a video project, I always recommend shooting what we call GVs, general views. That might be the exterior of a building that, you know, that per pertains in some way to your project or a landscape likewise and cutaways. Those are very close up shots. You see them on the news all the time. Hands moving, details in the scene around whatever action is unfolding. Um, and at most for um, an audio that allows you to patch things over if you decide to make cuts. Um, but also ask your, if you're doing a documentary piece, ask your interviewees more questions than you think you'll need, um, just in case your edit takes a different direct, your whole project takes a different direction to what you planned, or indeed in case they say something absolutely brilliant. You can run, run, run yourself ragged, giving yourself too many options, but some well-planned extras really can pay huge dividends later. And what we often say is some of these moments can be clipped. This is the beauty of digital. As Sarah said, you don't want to create a whole nother podcast, but if you've got some beautiful moments, maybe they can become little sort of 15 second moments that can become great bits of promotional material. So not everything is lost when it sort of drops on the cutting room floor, as it were. Just, just that idea, thank you, thank you, Naki. Just that idea of sort of well-planned extras, does it, can, can you apply that to any digital project? Because we, we're talking quite, quite specifically about film and, uh, you know, or, or vi video. How would you say, could you apply that to something else? Yeah, I just for I mean, um, so Rob and I both have like quite strong marketing backgrounds. And I think like being the person in the company that is trying, <laughs> trying to like get a view uh, in the room or behind the scenes without being there is, um, yeah, that you I speak carefully, but I don't think you can have too much content. Because you're, you're always, you know, we live in like this online world and there's such a need um, for like daily content. You know, their algorithms are, are horrible. They're always asking for more, you know, they need feeding. And so having that additional stuff to feed them with is what Natalie's talking about. It's like the stuff that you think, oh no, well, what are we going to do with this? Um, there'll be a need, you know, there'll be a use for it. So yeah, always get too too much than too little. Without killing yourself, I suppose, to, you don't want to carry on and on and on, do you? You have to kind of yeah. make sure you keep it manageable. Um, any other thoughts, that, anything else that uh, you'd like to add about thinking about produ production, Sarah, anything that's um, come to you as Natalie's been talking? Not really. I think Natalie's like covered it in such a, um, yeah, really clear way. So no, I didn't think so. Rob, is there anything that you would like to add? No, I don't think so. That's covered everything. That was fantastic. Okay. The only thing, Linda, I'm just going to come up a PS. Yeah. Um, the PS is actually is about sound, which is um, you can cover um, duff pictures, video, um, much more easily than you can cover dropped sound. So really often, especially if it's a if it's got a visual element, if it's 
if it's got if it's an audio vid video project often what gets sort of the sort of Cinderella bit of it is often the audio but actually it is much easier to edit around cleverly caption deal with poor video than it is to deal with audio especially for a viewer audio is really you really need the audio to be clear um, good and consistent with you know not a lot of background noise etc cetera, etc cetera, for for a viewer so don't don't dismiss audio in favour of your pictures because it's really crucial. Yeah. Okay. And again, and that's made me think again, again about the, the point of accessibility and thinking about and how 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 clear sound is and how are you going to get your point across if people aren't able to hear in the way that you do and all of that stuff as well. Thinking about the, the different ways you you connect with your audiences and, and tell your story. Okay. Um and uh, just a couple of other questions I wanted to add in was this idea of sort of te testing, testing and prototyping. And we, we talked a little bit about, you know, che checking what's going on. But any thoughts on how do you how do you check you're on the right track as your as your production process goes through? Any kind of recommendations for that? I think it's just it's that thing about not being because it's artistic, there is, there is such a protectiveness over the work, and there should be, but I think it is about creating um, this sort of community of critical friends. Um, you know, with the Space Commissions, they sort of come with a package of uh, critical friends, so there's a sounding board, but I'm just aware that if you, you, don't, you don't have that funding in place, um, you might think, who do I look to? And I think it's just about building up the, that community and letting them in as early as possible when things are still flexible and can be tweaked. Um, because ultimately, I mean, even if these people within your community are not, um, you know, they're not specialists, what they might be is they might mirror your audience. And so just letting another voice in that can take a look and say, oh, I'm not, not sure that really works. Um, is, you know, it's just always good to have an extra pair of eyes or ears. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think it's that flexibility and being open to feedback when it's still possible to implement that feedback if you need to. And not, here's this thing, it's ready. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's the brave thing to do, isn't it? It's just let, let people have a look and put it put it out. OK, thank you. Um, does anybody have a particular example of a production process that you think has gone really well that you would like to use to illustrate what you're talking about? And I, I mean, uh, that might be a bit of an unfair question, but I thought if something if something came to mind that had been fantastic. It might be really useful to think what what was it that happened that made it good? Yeah, I've got one. Um, she actually joined us on a webinar not long ago. It was another interactive project um, from a team called Can't Sit Still, and it was a children's experience. And so, again, they came to us with an idea and they actually did have a platform in place, but they'd never used that platform. And when I'm talking about like the interactive and the platforms, you know, they can be um, they're this branching narrative um, technologies, basically. And so they sell themselves quite rightly as being um, much easier to use than if you were gonna build it from the ground up. The problem is they're still really um, quite difficult to get your head around and they're quite time consuming. And so for someone who's never used them before, it's really important to understand the complexities within it and to speak to other people who are using that technology for the first time. And so what they did was they had those conversations. How long did it take? You know, what, what are some of the mistakes that you made? Um, how can I make sure that I don't make the same mistakes? And I think because they were just so open about um, what they didn't know, um that project was such a success because they put in as natalie was saying the like all of the contingency plans b c z 
they had it all covered. So when they went in there and shot it and things inevitably did go wrong, they had that buffer because they went in with as much knowledge as possible. Yeah. Actually, I think we should put the link to that webinar in because I think both of the projects we spoke about on that branching narrative webinar are really good examples, weren't they, of, of testing and, and, and also, I thought they were both really good on working out how, well, sorry, she, that, that can't sit still was really good on working out how to integrate the digital production process with, you know, a, a live show. And I think that's a thing that will, you know, it's another question really, isn't it? So how do you get the true thing? If you've got something that already exists, how do you create a digital version of it? How do you integrate those two production processes? Yeah. Um, any last thoughts before we move on from any of you? I was just going to mention as a, a good example, this is this this was a capture project um, a few years ago, a company called Mind the Gap um, captured their dance piece, A Little Space, and they did a huge mix. So five dancers, they, the theatre show pre-existed, had, had I think toured twice before it was captured, um, but they decided they wanted, they didn't want to film it in a kind of front-on way. Um, in front of a live audience, they really wanted to climb inside the stage show, make it more cinematic, pull out some particularly intimate moments, some particularly striking moments. Um, it's sort of a story about being alone and loneliness, five characters existing in a block of flats, kind of sometimes together, sometimes apart. And they really, so the shoot was two days, they really broke down and spent a lot of time thinking about how they were going to get the kind of cinematic feel that they wanted. There were various concerns about audio at various points, pulling out audio. So the director said, well, the, the cast know this inside out. We've got a solid rehearsal period beforehand. I will ensure that for some specific moments, the cast can do it without music. They can perform in time without music. And I thought, no way and the, the, it, the, the film company director I was speaking to thought this is to feel to be that precise that you can cut in an audio a silent moment into the final piece that is going to be incredible he was absolutely right the theatre director knew both himself the amount of rehearsal time and the skill of the five performers and it worked perfectly and unfortunately it's not I can put a link to behind the scenes in the trailer but it's no longer available to view license rights licensing um but it was a really really stunning piece and made all the stronger for the kind of immersive filming um approach that they took to it lovely thank you thank you um oh yeah so just people are asking is there a structured methodology or pro uh, project management tool that anybody has used or an example of a project plan so I might leave that with the, you as panelists. If you think of something, because we'll have a break in a minute, you could drop that in and it might be that other people have, um, have suggestions as well. Um, so Natalie, can I just, so we're gonna finish up in a second, but just this end, the idea of we're talking about production and then post-production. So in telly, you make that distinction between kind of collecting together all the material you need and then the post-production is the edit, isn't it? And sort of the curation stage and organising your material. Can you make that same distinction in digital projects? Yeah, in, to some degree, I think you absolutely have to for your own sanity, because for any kind of project, I think there's a phase where the driving force is gathering the building blocks of your project, whatever that looks like or sounds like. And then a separate phase when you kind of build them or curate them into the final product. Um, and there is a bit of an alchemy in that curation process, as there is for curating anything, a museum exhibition or anything. Um, and so you need to allow time and thinking space to polish that project, engage the critical friends that Sarah mentioned and make it audience ready. And that's whether you're perfecting an Instagram caption and carousel or a film or beta testing an XR project. I mean, it really, there's gotta be a point for curation and then polishing before you share with a wider audience. But and then we're going back to the idea that you, you don't want to kind of, as you said, you know, somebody said, you don't wanna to have to get to the point where you're fixing it in the edit because that's the most expensive thing you can do, isn't it? 
yeah that should strike cold into the heart of anyone will fix it in the edit much more time much more money and might not be possible you know it's it's all very well to say we'll fix it in the edit but it might not be possible with what you've got so yeah that's that's a, a one-way road to madness or we'll fix it in the edit <laughs> okay so thank you very much um we're going to stop now we'll take a, a five minute screen break and we'll reconvene at five past three and move into our last section. So any any other questions anybody has, just add them in during the, the break and we'll we'll deal with those when we come back. So see you all at five past. Okay, so uh, we're ready to move into that last phase. Um, before we, well, sort of really sort of finishing up the idea of post-production, is there anything left? It's, I'm sort of asking Rob this really, but just the others might have a point. Before we move into kind of putting your work out there, is there anything left that we need to cover? Okay, okay. So then, Rob, what, so, you know, you, you, we've created and crafted and curated this beautiful work. You want to put it out into the world. What do you need to be thinking about at this point? Um, I think it's, it's a really, really difficult point because um, in this phase, you will have uh, been on quite a journey with your work. Um, and you will have gone through your pre-production phase and your production phase. And by this point, you've got what we call an unshakable burden of context. You know absolutely everything there is about this digital project that you've created and what the audiences are supposed to get from it, you know, plot details, you know, you know, interactive mechanics, you know, absolutely everything that's in there. Um, and it can be really, really difficult to then say, well, look, how do we present this to an audience, really? How do we put this out there? Um, and I think it's really important to recognise how 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 difficult that can sometimes be for us at that point. Um, you need to be really, really clear in how you communicate this work to people, and you need to be really, really clear um, with yourself about um, how much work that's going to take. Um, it's really, really important to, to try and get external eyes on your work. It's really important to try and get people to proof it, to keep looking at it and be open to change even at that point as well, because you may find that you've created something brilliant and then at the point at which you want to introduce an audience to it, there's some element there that they're not quite getting. There's some element that they're not quite grasping. There's some sort of obstacle that maybe needs to be addressed within the onboarding. And there are lots and lots of non-digital parallels to that. The first time anyone's been to a piece of promenade theatre or something, you might be aware of the overall concept, but in terms of the actual practicalities, you might say, well, how is this going to work? Um, if you were going to go to a, um, a, an immersive arts experience or something like that in a, in a gallery or an exhibition centre, again, you might need that little bit of, of handholding from audiences. And the same is absolutely true with digital projects. In the creative sector, we're often pushing against the boundaries of what tech's been used for before or, or using something in a completely new um, an exciting way and again we need to make sure that we're communicating that to audiences in the materials that we put out and how we explain that piece so um, I would say just as important as it is to prove the materials itself do you get someone to to proof and test your onboarding materials your marketing materials as well um, as Sarah said uh, earlier on um, some people do think of digital work as inherently a, a marketing exercise we can just put this out there into the world and a million people will find it and hopefully 10% of those will buy tickets for our show or whatever it might happen to be. Um, that's absolutely not the case. Um, these things are going to need pushes all of their own, exactly as if you were opening a new venue or a new exhibition centre or launching a new show or something like that. So really do think about it from that point of view as well. And again, as I say, anything that you've done in order to hopefully make something uh, transformative and take the advantage of everything, every mechanic that digital affords to you. Again, as Natalie said, it may be, you know, you're not just putting a camera on a wide shot in front of a show and, and filming it and that's the end. Um, it may be that you've done something that audiences need to know about or be prepared for in advance as well. So have a real think about that. Um, and the other thing is, again, when it comes to onboarding, again, looking at 
real world alternatives. Um, consider the, the number of ushers that we employ in theatres to help people find their seats. You know, they're there to help someone in a theatre make their way to the correct row and seat number that's quite often printed in block capitals on the middle of a ticket that they've got in their hand. You often go up to the door, show it to the usher, they read it back to you and, and point you in, in the right direction. Um, we're doing all that sort of stuff to make sure people are comfortable in those spaces and then quite often I think we forget to lay on as much audience support when we do something digitally. Um, as I say, we're often doing something new, we're often doing something unusual, we're often doing something on a, a new platform, something that people are not familiar with, they haven't done before. Um, so, you know, we really need to provide at least as much onboarding for our online audience and to be as patient with them as we would do for an in-person show as well. Um, a little word as well, when we're talking about marketing too, I know that anyone that's engaged in any digital marketing, it can be sometimes difficult to get traction if you're just trying to say, come along to a stand-up comedy show at this venue on this day, something where there aren't too many unknowns there, there aren't too many new concepts to, to uh, introduce people to. If you're doing digital marketing, have a real think about what information people need and how you're going to say that as quickly as possible. Um, I think sometimes when we do digital projects, we, we maybe talk more about the process rather than the audience experience. And I think too that we are incredibly aware of poster blindness, for example. And I don't think people always realise how prevalent that is online as well. Um, your digital marketing materials rarely appear on a page on their own. They're quite often in feeds that people are scrolling past from one item to the next and you have literally seconds to try and capture someone's attention on a page with lots and lots of other messages going on as well. So, you know, when you publish, you're not on a stage uh, with people's attention for the next two minutes. It's more like you're on the street with a high-vis tabard and a clipboard asking a string of commuters on their lunch break if they've got 10 seconds to talk about a charitable cause. And that's on a street full of people all shouting similar messages as well. Um, it's difficult to do. So again, have a real think about how you simplify that message and how you make it about the audience experience rather than necessarily a new type of tech or, or, or any kind of benefit to you of, of telling your stories in this new and exciting way. The audience is absolutely key on that. Um, and then I suppose be aware that it will take time to build that audience as well. You know, it, it will take a lot of hard work. And I think sometimes when you get to this stage, you're maybe a little bit tired, you're a little bit exhausted, you're a little bit strung out on this immense big project that you've done. You're delighted to have got it all in the bag. You're delighted to have got it all on time and on budget and so on and so forth. And you've just seen the piece in the edit suite or on your phone or in whatever format it happens to be in. And again, you've got that unshakable burden of context and it's difficult for you to think about how is a new audience going to reach this and the amount of work that's needed. So um, yeah, it's really worth just being aware of how much time it's going to take at that stage. Does that, does that all make sense? It does make sense. And, it, and it's making me wonder if there's any examples which might not pop into your head immediately, but of organisations or arts, you know, groups or whoever that you think have done it really well. Just, and it, that's not just to you, Rob, but, you know, because we're saying this takes a lot of work and it's effort. And I think who does it really brilliantly? Where are the examples that we might learn from somebody who's really hit the nail on the head? So. I think what's quite interesting is some of the clearest examples come from the organisations who may launch a digital project and then they've built in time to pay attention to how it's received and to adapt and to act on that feedback very, very quickly. So there's been a, a few projects I've seen where people said, brilliant, this is this work is here in our museum, for example, we've got an installation, people can try VR headsets, can try all sorts of things. And they paid real close attention in that first day or two to how people are engaging with it. And they may say, actually, people need, we do need a member of staff here or a volunteer here, or we need more signage, or we need whatever it might happen to be. And they act on that incredibly, incredibly quickly. That post-production period, that period of putting it out into the world is part of the creative process as well, in exactly the same way that a stage show might make changes and amends over the course of a run, or in the same way that um, an exhibition may may adapt or, or evolve over the course of its run as well as it moves from location to location. It's really worth saying, making sure that you've you've got enough time in your in your process in your um, post production phase to 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 make those changes if you need to make them as well. You're talking about making changes to 
the, the sort of tactics that you use to reach an audience rather than making changes to the content? Well, it may be the content itself as well. You may say, actually, this needs to break down or, or split down. You know, it may be that you say, maybe this needs to be presented in a different way too. You know, it, it, it could be all manner of things. You know, I've seen people, particularly if someone does have an opportunity to move something from location to location in a physical installation, it may be there are changes there. Or it may be that you've got something like a an ongoing series like a podcast or something like that and you may say actually this format's not quite working or we've got lots of audiences dropping off after a particular point i know me and you have spoken before linda about um i suppose digital projects where they're clearly they're sort of slavishly committed to replicating an in world uh, and in real world experience or additionally once they've started putting things out into the world they 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 feel consistency is more important than um than that kind of audience experience you know people might say well it's not really working but we don't want to make changes now because we want it to be consistent and you have to say well you're consistently not going to reach an audience in that case you know it's it's that that whole thing about making sure people are able to to make changes if they if if they identify that that's going to have better results for the audience thank you um sarah have you have you got any thoughts on this sort of late, late, the end stages, the getting the work out there. Yeah, I'd say so. Exactly what Rob said. It can be. It's like the most exciting time because all of you know the audience haven't seen it yet. So all of all of the thing that you've worked towards is there. Like the time has come. The curtains going back, and it's the exact time. Typically, a lot of people might run out of steam <laughs> because. Yeah. They know it and and so it's not new to them anymore. And so what I would say is, I know I will just keep banging this drum. The projects that do the best consistently are the ones where they go back to the exact plan that they drew up at the beginning in the pre-production phase and that they have stayed true to. So um, one project, I won't, you know, we've, got so many examples of things that have like gone out online and you know they've got tens of thousands of views and we can touch upon some of the things that that make that possible and um the audience toolkit that natalie posted like it's all in there it's it's quite formulaic um but one so the interactive project's really interesting because they don't lend themselves naturally to getting like this phenomenal audience online and one, um, another project that I worked on just this year um, was with a virtual magic school, and he's also done a webinar with us. Um, and what made that so interesting is he, he came with a really clear idea of who he wanted to reach. And it was quite limited in terms of like, this is the audience. And it was primary schools across um, across England and Scotland, and it was going to be for free, but it ha had to be restricted. It wasn't it wasn't then going out um, online being publicised. And I think just having that idea that that's who it was going to go to and then using the production bit to yes, focus on making this like really brilliant experience, but doing all of the amazing wraparound work that was needed to chime with that audience. So he spoke with, um, I, I put him in touch actually with other organizations who lent their support for free. I, should, I will also talk about the importance of leaning on other people, other artistic communities. How do you create this brilliant educational wraparound resource? Because that is what the teachers are going to look at. So having the idea of who you want to reach and then using that phase to create the other work, whether it's the social assets, the trailers that are going to be doing it all, use that phase to prep that. So when he launched it, he already had this amazing sign up list of all of these teachers that were just so eager to get their hands on this thing because he'd kept them updated um, through newsletters um, and then when it was ready he could hand it over because all of that hard work had been done with yeah. how do you tie it to the curriculum this is who we're going to reach go back to your initial plan and just implement it because you know Rob, Rob is completely right there is a sort of fatigue that comes with you know then you launch the thing but if you've got it all there at the beginning 
you just follow your own instructions and it just takes away that stress because you might have used up a lot of the sort of creative thinking over the course of the project. So that's one like quite niche example, but every project, I th if they come to us and they say, oh, it's just not getting the views that we thought, you know, we put targets on our um, content. And if, if they haven't got the views, it is really, I, I not even say nine times out of 10, I really think it's 10 times out of 10. Have they followed the steps in the plan? Because if they, if they have, no, if they haven't, it's just a case of like going back and saying, okay, well, you haven't applied for social spend. You haven't reached out to the partners. You haven't done that unless it's something really, really, really rogue. But, mm they don't happen it's um so yeah i just yeah yeah the 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 it's interesting as well i think we talked about that pre-production phase as well we talked about identifying what it is you're trying to achieve who it is that you want to reach with this piece and for what reason you know what your metrics are um again a few people have talked about kind of project management tools and things like that and i'm a big fan of a really simple one or two pager that you can write with your team that is basically you agreeing why you're doing this and who it is that you're trying to reach and for what reason and then really stick to it because most of the projects I've seen where they start to stumble it's because they lose sight or they do not have the discipline to stick to their reasons for doing this piece in the first place the reasons they've agreed we've all seen I mean my, I know Natalie we've talked about this as well occasionally you do see projects um, out in the wild that do make you sort of scratch your head and wonder who is this for you know and and it's that that problem where someone's clearly lost sight and it might be again to quote Natalie from earlier on it may be that you're creating something and you do have a fantastic piece of footage that you didn't plan on having um be really mercenary about whether or not that fits in this project because it doesn't have to again to quote you it doesn't have to stay on the cutting room floor you can save it and use it for something else don't start letting the scope of your project creep as soon as you get into production and you just start doing things that are not in service of that audience that you're trying to reach and that response that you're trying to generate by all means save them for other things do them for other things and then exactly as sarah's saying hopefully you should get into post production with a piece that is absolutely perfect for that audience that you agreed right at the very beginning of this that you were trying to reach that you were trying to serve and that you can then put it out there and reach those audiences with it as well it's about really sticking to that yeah. Thank you. I'm just going to ask one more thing and then we'll um, we're we going to stop for a couple of minutes to ask the audience to do fill in the evaluation for the webinar yeah. and then we'll come back for final thoughts from the three of you. We've only got just got a few minutes left. But the one thing I wanted to pick up on was this idea of social spend. I don't know who wants to cover that. You know, is it is it worth spending some money on social? So I don't so Rob or Sarah question you both look like you're about to, who who wants to take it yeah I think I think it's both it's either but um I do you know what I'd even go as far as say it's all three because Natalie <laughs> <laughs> Natalie now no, it's like we actually make it um compulsory to ring fence a little bit of social spend mm -hmm. for each project and so that's why you know um Natalie with her production background even as she's going through the budget is like does it have social spend because it's it's completely it's imperative because of the algorithms of the platforms um and so what it's really really good for is targeting specific audiences that you cannot otherwise reach there are all sorts of things that you can do to reach people within your circle or within your wider network um and again it's that like favor and the collaborativeness of of being in in the arts but the social spend does go a really really long way mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be thousands of pounds doesn't need to be hundreds of pounds but if you've got a tenner and you don't know what to do with it put it on put it on an ad um because that that's just how you that's how you're gonna get the new people yeah it's worth it's worth recognizing as well it's not just about numbers it's not just about getting lots and lots of numbers on your piece all of those platforms when you're putting paid spend on 
you have incredible targeting tools available to you at that point. So all of the different pieces of information that those social platforms know about someone in terms of their likes and dislikes, their social habits, whereabouts in the country they are, all these sorts of things. Um, you've got all of that available to you. So if even if you're just saying we just want 150 people who are interested in taking photographs of statues in the West Midlands, those platforms will let you find those people for a tenner. You know, it's it's got such fantastic targeting um, options available to you and how you filter those audiences. So just for that reason alone, it's it's really worthwhile. Yeah. Thank you. And Natalie, I could see you were waving and then I'll call you to that. Then we'll finish this last section. I, I know I'm going to be speedy. It's just to say my background is not marketing and I would say from from working at space there's been there's two sort of golden bullets available to you in terms of distribution which Rob and Sarah touched on one is social spend and I've been amazed truly amazed because I don't come from marketing what social spend can do as Rob and Sarah just hinted uh, and the other is the seeding list that I think we've kind of referred to obliquely but maybe not called the name the two s's social spend and seeding list and the seeding list is what you do what Sarah's saying you do right at the beginning and it's a list of all the possible partners you could build for a piece of work really thinking through the themes of a project you know Rob mentioned statues in the West Midlands well would, would the West Midlands local authorities be interested are there galleries that are interested are there community groups that work with sculpture, you know, who has kilns in the way, you know, you can be quite lateral about, and then you approach them all and ask it far in advance if when your project is ready, they'll be willing to share it. And so you create your own network of distributors. It might be a peer network, it might be more than that, but you kind of are tapping into to their audiences too. And a sort of how to from Rob and Sarah about how to build a seeding list is in the audience's toolkit that I link to. Um, but yeah, for someone who is relatively, you know, three years into this, I would say those two things really can kind of supercharge a project's distribution. Lovely. Thank you. OK, so um, we're going to put the link into the evaluation form into the in, in chat. Please, please fill it in. It's so, so helpful to us to understand what you liked, what you didn't like, what else we could be doing. It's only a handful of questions will allow two minutes, which should be enough to do that form. It's not onerous. And then I'll come back to the three of you um, just for a, a final tip or reflection or something. Is there anything else that you would like to share with the audience before we finish up? So that's just a chance for the three of you to have a think about that. So hopefully the... Um, the evaluation for oh there it is I can see it, it went in at fifteen twenty six thank you so just a, a minute or so and then we'll, we'll we'll come back to the panel for a final moment each. Okay, um, final thoughts with, yeah, half a minute each. If there's, if there's one, and if you don't have any, if there's nothing you want to share, then just say pass. <laughs> but if, if there, is there one last thing that you would like to share with the audience? N Natalie, I'm gonna start with you. Do you have anything? I'd say um, my top do's would be, do know your project inside out, all aspects of it. Do, get buy-in from the people in your team, partners, creatives, get a network of people who bought into the creative ambition of this project. And my top don't is don't, under, don't overestimate what you have the time or money or skill set to do. And that's not to be, that's not to be limited in your ambitions. It's just to be realistic so you can deliver the be very best version of the project that you can. Lovely. Thank you very much. Sarah, what about you? 
I'm not as eloquent as Natalie, but um, for do, I would say um, just collaborate with as yeah. many people as possible. Um, you know, take take people out for coffees, catch up on Zoom, have it. Just ask the people, and that is connected to do ask stupid questions. Um, if if someone isn't telling you something. It's either because that information is really, really valuable, so you really need to find out what it is, or they don't know the answer, and so they don't want to tell you. So I just think, um, and connected to that would be don't hide what you don't know, um, because it can, like, as in with yourself and with your collaborators as well, just be really honest about the problems that are facing you and the information you need to sort of overcome it um because i think you know people in your network are there to help we're certainly there to help our projects and i think it's just that getting that conversation moving and being really really honest and saying this is a barrier i don't know how to do this because it's only by doing that people are going to be able to give you the answers lovely it's like a lesson in life that isn't it yeah. really? <laughs> <laughs> rob just 30 seconds because we're at half past any last uh, thoughts from you yeah, I, I would say um, you're, you're just about pre-production, really. Your pre-production period, if you do go through and have those conversations with your team, make sure people have got ownership over the project and they will absolutely understand why you're doing that project. Again, a simple one or two pages, something where you just write down something and you all agree on it in really specific words. This is what we're doing and why and who it's for. Um, will save you so many headaches later on because it informs so many of the decisions and stick to that that's the other thing you have to be really mercenary agree to those aims stick to them all the way through the project um, again they'll give you your metrics at the end of it so that hopefully for the sake of your own mental well-being you come out of the other end feeling really really good about what you've accomplished lovely um, and all that's left for me thank you is to say thank you very much for sharing um, your experience, your advice, your recommendations and your, your thoughts on all of this. And thank you very much, audience, for taking part and for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing anybody who's interested in the ne our next webinar is on the 22nd of March. And we'll be looking at digital rights and details will be up on our website shortly. Thank you all. Bye bye. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>